I'd like to welcome you all to our fair fireside. We're happy to uh, have John Gee here. John Gee is direct from Egypt, actually. He was yeah. just there this last week. Um, John Gee is, uh, uh, he's been the editor. He's, first of all, he teaches at BYU. He's been the editor of eight books and has edited the peer-reviewed International Egypt Egyptological Journal. He's published, how many articles have you published? I've got a, over 150 publications. Over 150 publications. And uh, he served on the board of trustees of national and international organizations. So clearly, he's someone who is eminently qualified, which brings up the first question that we get, you know, because we ask people to submit questions. Why is it on the internet some people think you're such a terrible scholar or a terrible, such a terrible person? Why, why does that come up? Um, I don't know. I, it, well, there are a number of, of reasons that it might, but it's a, one of these vague general accusations that doesn't have any details. And it's a form of um, the, the typical uh, expression for it is uh, called poisoning the well. Mm -hmm. And it's where you, it's a form of an, uh, of an ad hominem fallacy. It's one where you shift the attention from the argument to the arguer. And rather than deal with the substance of the argument, you attack the person. So uh, by claiming that you're a terrible scholar, a terrible person, this isn't really something my Egyptological colleagues say to me, or at least not to my face. Um, and some of them are actually fairly complimentary, but... Well, you, I mean, you're, you've edited an Egyptological journal. You've, yeah. uh, you've been on the board for different organizations. organizations. Certainly, certainly they wouldn't invite you to be on the board if they thought you were a terrible scholar, one would think. Oh, yeah, one would think. Um, it's, it, but it's a, a, it's a matter of, a way of distracting uh, the argument so you don't actually deal with the argument, you just attack the person. Uh, and it's something that we actually should expect as Christians. Um, you know, we have statements of Jesus, ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? And uh, he also said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely right. uh, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Uh, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Uh, and you get this outside the church, but also inside the church, surprisingly enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a, another prophecy of Jesus. The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doth God service. Oh, yeah. uh, this is a good thing that they're doing. And, um, and you also remember what James said, know ye not, not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, so it and and vice versa, which brings up I think part of the thing I, I really like these quotes, but I think part of the thing is is some people have dismissed the Book of Abraham completely. They just said like that can't possibly be true, and here we have someone who's actually studied Egyptology who says yes, it is true or yes, it can be true, and so that that discord there they don't like. Why why is it we should I mean what Obviously, you've been interested in the book of Abraham for a while. What yeah. is it about the book of Abraham we should be interested in? Or what? what, what well, or, or the, why should it be of interest to us, I guess is a better way to put that. Well, if you look, probably the, the most important reason to be interested in the book of Abraham, you look at the way it's used in conference. Uh, Two-thirds of the quotations uh, of the book of Abraham in conference come from about five verses in chapter three that deal with the pre-existence 
and the purpose of life, why we're here, and what we are doing or should be doing here, and that this life is a test. Uh, that's th the most commonly used uh, scripture from the Book of Abraham in General Conference, about two to one anything else. Uh, it's the only passage from the Book of Abraham that's cited in the current missionary discussions. Hmm. Uh, this is the most important thing in the Book of Abraham, and most of the teachings about the church and from the church about pre-existence come from the Book of Abraham in their origin or derived from that, and it's just woven itself in the to the fabric of the church and its teachings. Uh, we can't talk about the plan of salvation without that. We, uh, it's referenced in half a dozen children's songs that are part mm -hmm. of the primary. It shows up in hymns. Uh, it's really worked its way as something distinctive about the Latter-day Saints and their teachings, and yet that comes from the Book of Abraham. If you go back into the Journal of Discourses, the early brethren said that they knew about the preexistence because Joseph Smith taught it. But if you go look in Joseph Smith's Nauvoo Discourses, he's getting that and says he's getting that from the Book of Abraham. Interesting. So when the Book of Abraham was canonized, then about there's about a 10-year lag, but then they started tying their church started tying its teachings back to the book of Abraham without really recognizing that that's where it had come from in the first place. Oh, okay. Interesting. So it had come home and we just hadn't realized that that's where it came from. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next question because we had some questions submitted here. What issue seems to be the biggest stumbling block for members on the topic of the book of Abraham? Well, um, looking through the questions that we got, and mm -hmm. we won't have time to cover them all, and no. uh, some of them are less questions and more accusations, but we'll lay those to the side. Um, but most of them center around the translation of the Book of Abraham, and some of them on the facsimiles. The Critics don't really get into the content of the Book of Abraham. They don't read it carefully, and in some cases don't read it at all. Uh, and a lot of them just dismiss it as not being historically authentic, so they don't need to read it, they don't need to test it. And so if you eliminate the text from consideration, then the only sort of discussion point that you get is the translation issue. So that's why the critics are all concerned with the translation, but not the result of the translation. Um, putting that in Egyptological terms, uh, mm -hmm. it would be like spending all your time in graduate school discussing how you get the translation, but not actually translating the text. Interesting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, tearing apart the grammar and how it was put together or the dictionary and how it was put together, but not what's actually written in the text, um, which is not what we do in the profession. No, I wouldn't think so. But we do discuss those issues when we're doing the translations in class to show you how you do it, but we rarely discuss that sort of issue when we're actually dealing with the result of our colleagues' works or new texts as they come out. Okay. Okay. So let's go on to the next question then. So there's a couple of theories. There's the catalyst theory. There's the missing scroll theory. Are you open to the catalyst theory or do you remain confident the book of Abraham was the missing scroll? Well, I think I'm the scholar most associated with the missing scroll theory. Um, and I think I've probably laid out most of the arguments that are used for that theory. Um, and 
So there are three theories. There's basically one, the one pushed by the anti-Mormons, which says we, Joseph Smith translated the Book of Abraham from the fragments that we currently have. Um, and the missing scroll theory says that there were other papyri that Joseph Smith have that we no longer have, and that is a better match for where the Book of Abraham comes from. And the third theory is that there, the, the papyri served as a catalyst for Joseph Smith to get revelation, and that it wasn't on any of the, the scrolls. Uh, so it wouldn't, now it wouldn't matter what was on the scrolls because it just right. it just inspired him to write something. It inspired him to get revelation. Now, mm -hmm. um, whether you're inside or outside of the church kind of depends on what you think the source of that revelation is, or what you might think revelation is. But that's those are the three general theories. Uh, well, the one theory, the I think the that the Book of Abraham comes from scrolls that we currently have, that's readily falsifiable. So it's scientific in, in that sort of sense because you can demonstrate that that one doesn't, isn't true. And I think that's why the, um, the critics prefer that theory. Right. Um, but it's also falsifiable in the sense that if you go back and look at eyewitness statements, they indicate that it's not on the scrolls that we currently, or the fragments that we currently have. We don't have any scrolls. Mm -hmm. And so it's also falsifiable in that sense. Um, and so that leaves the other two theories. And for a long time, I couldn't find anything that would indicate any evidence that would indicate which one of those might be preferable. Uh, but in the end, I found two or three pieces of evidence that seemed there that indicate that the missing scroll theory accounts for more of the evidence than the catalyst theory. And so that is the one that I prefer mm -hmm. because that's where the evidence tends to, to indicate to you. I'm I'm open to the, the catalyst theory. I considered it seriously for years. I haven't, it, I haven't considered it seriously in years because it do, there's not enough evidence for it and there's more evidence to indicate that Joseph Smith, uh, so one of the pieces of evidence besides that the statement that Joseph Smith makes when he introduces the book of Abraham that this is records that have fallen to, into our hands from the catacombs of Egypt. But there's also one of the last discourses he made in Nauvoo quotes language from the book of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Smith said that he got that, it says it's Abraham's reasoning and says that he learned it from just translating a papyrus that's in his house. Oh, okay. And so um, it's not the best evidence. Mm -hmm. So we get that from notes that somebody made and it's possible that the notes are inaccurate, but it's least some evidence. And it indicates that Joseph Smith says that he got it from a papyrus and he translated it in his house. That I think um, so it's one of the few statements that we have that comes from Joseph Smith that indicates anything about the translation of the Book of Abraham. So it's a, a good source. It's uh, and it seems to indicate uh, that that's what he thought, and so that's why. I go with that theory because I think the evidence supports that and I don't get, uh, I don't find direct evidence that supports the catalyst theory. I, it's a, I think a decent second choice, mm -hmm. but I think it's a second choice, at least for me and as far as I can tell with the evidence. I think it's interesting that we 
we often think of the world in 1830 or 1840 of people going around with video recorders and recording everything that happened exactly. So you can just go back and look at this full, complete record of, of what, what happened. And all we have is fragments of what thing people, things people wrote down in journals and, and things. And it's, it's, we don't have a complete record. Right. We don't have, for nothing really do we have as, as good a historical record as we would like. Mm-hmm. Um, as any historian would like. And the further you go, you go back, the more spotty the record becomes. Uh, so dealing with ancient history, oftentimes you have tremendous gaps in the record. Um, we would always like more and better evidence, but you have to deal with the evidence you actually have. Right. And when you're testing theories, you want to you want the one that accounts for the most evidence. Right. And uh, you, there's almost an, an infinite number of theories that people can come up with. Uh, and you want something that you can test, as it were, scientifically. It's got to be falsifiable. You, can, mm-hmm. uh, you may not be able to prove it true, but it some cases you can prove it false and that's useful Mm -hmm. that's the way scientific theories are tested and so sometimes you don't have evidence that would allow you to decide between two competing theories and you're just stuck with it right right and there are plenty of those in in history in this case i think the evidence leans a little bit more one direction okay let's move on to the next question then um, who are those unnamed and unsourced Mormon and non-Mormon eyewitnesses who saw the long scroll? Uh, this is uh, typical of some of the questions we got in. It's uh, somewhat... Yeah. Um, somewhat I mean, just, a bit. <laughs> Yeah, unnamed and unsourced, um, at least in... I've got a whole article on the, uh, on the witnesses to... To the so they are diary. named and they are sourced. They are named and they are sourced, and in my book, I named and sourced the ones I quoted from. So I'm not sure where they're getting this from, but I put together a, a quick list of mm-hmm. the from the ones that I cited of who they are. So the Latter Day Saint one, we have W. W. Phelps in 1835 and Joseph Smith in 1835 and Oliver Cowdery in 1835, Warren Parrish in 1838. Um, William Appleby in 1841, uh, Robert Horn in 1893, and uh, Jerusha Blanchard. The publication of this is in 1922, Mm -hmm. um, but Jerusha Blanchard was uh, in the Joseph Smith home before then, and this is, but by the time her account gets published, it's 1922. Mm -hmm. Non Latter day Saints. Uh, we have an A. Gardner, don't know what the A stands for, but this was published in newspaper in 1835, William West in 1837, an anonymous newspaper report in 1840, um, Charlotte Haven's letters in 1843, Henry Coswell in 1843, um, Charles, Fran- or Charles Francis Adams' uh, his journal entry from 1844. Uh, Josiah Quincy is also present for that. He published his in 1883, but the uh, but they were both there and at the same interview with Joseph Smith. Got it. Yeah. Um, some Quaker who just signed the initial M. Hmm. Okay. In his report in 1846. And Gustavo Seyfarth in 1856. Now, Seyfarth is one of the more interesting of these because Seyfarth was a retired uh, university professor from Germany Mm -hmm. who in his retirement settled in the United States. And Seyfarth was a rival to Champollion. Mm -hmm. And so he had his own decipherment of Egyptian that he published earlier. It's not the one we use. Um, one of the critiques of it was that no one else could figure it out. Okay. 
he was a superb copyist. Mm -hmm. So if you look at his copies of Egyptian documents, uh, it's like reading the actual document. He is that good. It's like he's an ancient Egyptian scribe. Mm -hmm. But his translations have to be carefully dealt with because they don't m match the version that came through Champollion. And uh, Safarth saw the Joseph Smith papyri and describes them hmm. and translates what he thought was on them. Okay. Uh, and I went looking through Safarth's papers to see if he actually had a copy. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, um, all of his copies come from his trips to see museums in Europe. Oh. And so he doesn't have that I could find a copy of what he saw in St. Louis. Too bad. <laughs> uh, too bad, or... Or, or yeah. I, I don't know, when I, when I was looking through the papers, I thought, had this horrible thought. What if he actually copied the Book of Abraham, mm -hmm. and I found it? And no one would believe me if I found it. <laughs> right. So it was a good thing it wasn't there. <laughs> That's true. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> So, is it, so we have the facsimiles. We have the Book of Abraham and we have the facsimiles. Is it possible the interpretations on the facsimiles were not meant by Joseph Smith to be considered canonized scripture? Um, well, yeah, it's possible. But here, here again, there's a problem with the question as phrased. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we ever get Joseph Smith talking about canonized scripture. Oh, interesting. And the other problem is that we don't know that the interpretations on the facsimiles are actually Joseph Smith. Oh. We don't know that for certain. We, we assume that's the case. I assume that's the case. But we can't prove it. And if somebody wanted to argue that Willard Richards provided the interpretations, we couldn't prove it false because all the manuscripts for the interpretations we have are in Willard Richards' hand. Hmm. So, um, you know, we assume that that's Joseph Smith, but we can't prove it. And this is sort of the where you come at to the edge of what scholarship can do and where you don't have the evidence to prove, uh, False to, to falsify two different theories. If you wanted to say, well, the, the interpretations are all Willard Richards, you can't really falsify that. Everybody assumes it's Joseph Smith, and I assume it's Joseph Smith. But you can't really prove that. Hmm. And um, so, so yeah, it's entirely possible that the interpretations were not meant to be considered canonized scriptures, especially if you don't think that they're by Joseph Smith in the first place. But. Right. Um, but everybody runs off that assumptions, and everybody assumes that they're con they were canonized as scripture. Mm -hmm. So everybody assumes that that's the case. But that's one of the problems in dealing with the facsimiles is determining, you know, uh, what exactly the interpretations are. What do you think the facsimiles are? There are lots of different interpretations, and so it's a problem that we have to, to deal with, and it's useful to identify what our assumptions are, because right. we all make assumptions, but to be able to identify them and say, well, in this case, I assume that Joseph Smith authored the explanations mm -hmm. and that uh, they were intended to be published because he intended them to go with the, the scriptures. But those are all assumptions, and it's right. important to identify what we're assuming. And because oftentimes the assumptions we smuggle into our research trip us up. Mm -hmm. And with Book of Abraham, it's particularly important to identify what it is you're actually assuming. Okay, that makes sense, which brings up the next question, which is, as could be considered a hostile questions, I suppose. 
Do you know of any other LDS Egyptologists that concur with your conclusions besides Kerry Milstein? Well, actually, four of us got together and have a book coming out. I think it's supposed to be out in January. Okay. Um, and the ground rule of the book was, you know, we don't agree on everything, but we weren't going to put anything in the book that all of us couldn't agree with. So it'll be a good, good consensus of all the Egyptologists. Right. Be, well, maybe not all the. Well, we didn't get all the Egy uh, Larry <laughs> Saint Egyptologists, but yeah, we we had there you. there are four of us. We invited uh, two others to join us, mm -hmm. and uh, we at the beginning of the project, and for whatever reason, they declined. Um, one of you know I think family reasons on one mm -hmm. reasons one of them we just didn't get an email back and maybe we had the wrong email address but yeah. uh, you know we at least invite tried them. to invite them and that was one of the groundworks rules we had going in is that we don't want anything we don't want to put anything in the book that anybody feels uncomfortable with and in many mm -hmm. cases we had to revise things until we came up with something that we were all comfortable with. There are certain issues that, there are small points that we may disagree on, but they're not in the book. Right, right. So that sounds like it's a book to look forward to then. Yeah. One, one can hope. One can hope. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Why do the characters from the papyri that we have show up sequentially in three different manuscripts from three different scribes with the column headers of character and translation, I've seen this. I've seen this argument several times on the internet. I see it on Reddit frequently, yeah. and I've been emailed in, and so that's this is this is kind of a big big deal one. And 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 again, this is one of those things where there's a little bit of misinformation. So we'll pull up um, Book of Abraham manuscript one. Okay, this is one of the manuscripts. Character is written in the left margin. Um, it's a little bit damaged, but it doesn't say that the other one is translation. So you have the text of the Book of Abraham on the other side. So it doesn't, the way that the question's framed is misunderstanding of the evidence because we do have one, and this is the only one that mentions the character in the margin. So we look at, so here are all the the pages of the manuscript with the characters in the, margins. in the margins. And we'll kind of go through these one by one and look about where they come from. Okay. So the theory is that Joseph Smith just took the characters off in, in sequential lines um, and somehow knew that the characters read from right to left. Because if you look at some of the manuscripts uh, in those collections of papers, they're actually pulling the characters left to right. <laughs> so somehow these characters are known to be right from left, and that's correct, and they're supposed to go in that, that order. Uh, that's the theory. This is how it shows up in practice. So let's compare the characters. First character this is the way it looks in the manuscript, and okay. this is on the left, and this is the way it looks on the papyrus. Uh, it's a little damaged in the papyrus, but that is or should be a reed leaf, and that um, isn't quite the way I do it, but it's very close to the way that it's done in Heratic and Egyptian. So okay. that, that one works. Uh, then the next character, which should be there. I pulled this from a, a fuller example later in the papyrus. You can see it's a, um, it's a little bit neater made by the Egyptian scribe, but yeah, you can read that. Um, the next one, this is the way it should be. This is from the parallel text on the right, but you can see that they've kind of drawn that character in the margin. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't extant in the papyrus right now, but that's the next character that should show up. Um, then you get this character, um, mm -hmm. you know, and you can critique the the modern scribe, but that's so you have the the following character. Uh, then you get 
uh, this nice character um, and there's the heretic on it uh, this one I couldn't find a parallel on the papyrus for really? what this one was but there it is uh, that's the next character in line and then you get this character this is off the edge of the manuscript and um, you can see they had a little bit more that they were looking at uh, in 1835 when this was done um, and there's some of the papyrus is flaked off a bit uh, then you get this character and this character and so you, you, you can read these off this is the where sign uh, this is the the name Khonsu um, one of the non-trivial things here, uh, having taught Egyptian hieroglyphs, mm -hmm. is that these people, whoever's doing these characters, s tends to split them on the morpheme boundaries, so that they're actually getting where the different parts of the word break up, and they're putting them in, copying in there. That's not trivial. Whoever's doing this is guessing, if they're guessing, they're guessing right a lot. Um, mm. Doing better than my students. Oh, okay. Or the students I had yeah. at Yale. This is um, being able to split, to know where the words split up is one of the harder things with Egyptian hieroglyphs. And whoever's doing this is doing a pretty good job. Interesting. Uh, then you get, you get these uh, two hand signs, um, uh, then you get Yemes uh, from the papyrus, and uh, so yeah, I get some others. I'm amazed how detailed it is on the left side, how they're able to, you know, because I look at those, I go like, oh, really? That's like, I, yeah, I can kind of see that, but it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's, yeah. They, they're doing a pretty good job here, yeah, okay. uh, copying things. Um, Sometimes they're seeing better things than others. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a really, this is clearly the mess sign for born of, but it's, well, um, it's kind of hard to recognize in the copy. And this mm -hmm. is, you can see where the lines fit there or in this one here. Um, so they're copying these characters pretty accurately, and they're dividing up the words properly, or pretty uh, by, by and large. Pro, pro, by and large. By so and large. so back, back here you have, this is a name uh, uh -huh. going back here, and this is the first part of the name, but this is a sep. The name is composed of a couple of words, and mm -hmm. they've got the, the split up the words in the name. Mm -hmm. uh, this one here... Uh, and you can you can kind of see yeah this is where they here they've got a little bit more of this character than we have in, currently preserved mm -hmm. um, this whole complex here and more of that there so they they follow through and they're they're copying the stuff from the papyrus and they're doing a pretty good job and so when we look at the implementation of this. This is where this sign comes from, and this sign, and this sign. So slowly crawl across the screen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know where that one comes from, but then this one comes from here, and then there. And so they're slowly marching across that first line of right text. Right to left, yeah. Just, just right like to left. And then they skip down here. Whoa, wait a minute, that's not in order. That's not in order. And then they skip down here. And that's not way in order. And way down there and then back up here and then picking up the line again and going across okay and back and here we get the break and jump over there and so it's so to my mind I originally my, my, my oh, that's Totally different than the theory. The, 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 the theory, it should go this way. In reality, it jumps over the over the place. But as we step through the characters, you can see, yeah, this looks like a pretty good copy of, of this. Um, it helps having learned to read the heretic. 
mm-hmm. um, to recognize those characters. But uh, still, this is not, they're not pulling them. They're pulling them from the papyrus, but not necessarily in the order. And they're filling in with extra groups of characters that are out of order. Huh. So, of course, my brain immediately goes to the question that I don't think there's an answer to. What in the heck were they doing? <laughs> so. I, that, that's really the question that you have to... And, and so it's, I, I took a little more time with this one just mm-hmm. to show that... You, when in answering these questions, you have mm-hmm. to look at the you. The details are important to come up with your general situation, and you have to look carefully at the material you have, and and so you have to. Your theory needs to account for the details. Yeah. So in this case, you'd have to say the theory is that that was the translation method. They used that to translate the Book of Abraham. And if that's not possible because it doesn't go in order of the characters. Just uh, yeah, it looks like the characters come in later. There are some other indications, some cases where the characters tend to um, flow out of their column. Uh, you know, when they draw the they draw the margin line and they write the characters in the margin, but in some cases they cross the column. Uh, you. Hmm. Your theory needs to account for most of the details, and this particular theory doesn't account for the details as we actually have them. And so we need to look at we need to look at the details, and we need to come up with a theory if that uh, accounts for most of the details. And in this case. The theory is that the characters were just pulled straight off the papyrus in, in the fashion that uh, people have said doesn't quite work. It's interesting because I just read last week in something somebody sent to me that had it had that, that exact theory was put forward that you know the Book of Abraham it's, you know they, they used this as a translation method and this is what they did they took it in order and that you could and it's it's clear what Joseph Smith was doing. But looking again, looking at the evidence, it's not clear what was going on at that time. And, course, and to throw a wrench in the works, all of yeah. the alphabet and grammar stuff comes from a different papyrus. Ah, so it's not from... And it's, it's not in Heratic. It's in um, a linear form of Ptolemaic temple glyphs. So they're actually writing the hieroglyphs in there and not, uh, they're not writing Heratic. So it's not even the same script. And huh. so, if this is, if the grammar was used to translate it, then why don't we see more correspondence between the characters that they, and the, that supposedly made up the one text and then the characters that made up the other? If you're going to have a theory, you need to, you need to, you need to account for the data. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of the critics, because they don't read the characters, haven't realized that their proposal, which has Joseph Smith pulling the characters off the papyri, saying this is the Book of Abraham, generating this grammar, and then deciding to translate the text, doesn't actually work. Um, and should have been obvious that it didn't actually work because the character they knew they got the characters in the one case from this papyrus fragment and then the other ones come from a different papyrus fragment hmm. um, you think they would have noticed that maybe maybe they don't care <laughs> so. well that, that's kind of the, uh, the thought I had about the people who put these together right is uh, that they don't really care what the characters are or where they came from, uh-huh. and but this is this is one of those details that's important and why it's useful to at least be able to recognize the characters that you're looking at, right? And right. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be a matchup there. So the there's a problem with that theory. Uh, 
And in general, some of the documents, uh, we all want to lump them together and mm -hmm. treat all of these different documents as though they're part of the same project. We don't know that. We have to look at each of the documents individually and um, determine if we can. So handwriting of English is the easiest to determine mm -hmm. because that's a more or less known quantity. Uh, but we also have records of when the scribes were used. Uh, so when Joseph Smith is using which scribe and that's found in his journals and we can see where he says he hires one of them as a scribe, so we know that's the start mm -hmm. of his of his work. And uh, sometimes he'll say he passes his journal from one scribe to another. And sure enough, there's a change in handwriting. It usually comes in about two days before because he's behind in his journals. So he mm -hmm. passed it to the scribe and says, okay, let's catch up for the last two days or in one case, three weeks. Um, <laughs> and and the, one of the three weeks entries is, um, I don't recall anything else happening. Mm -hmm. And all the entries are really short, and so it's abbreviated. Uh, so, so we need to, um, you have to consider each of the documents individually and determine some cases you can find a relative order in some cases you can find uh, a couple of cases you can actually find things to peg to and you have to look at the documents and you have to look at what joseph smith is saying w w phelps has some letters to his wife that indicates some of the things that are going on and he provides some additional evidence to joseph smith uh, so you try to put these together and try to figure out where the documents go and then once you have that, then you want to see does your translation or your theory actually account for those, mm -hmm. uh, that translation timeline that you've built up from the documentary evidence. Mm -hmm. And most of the, you know, a lot of people have supposed that the writing down the characters uh, comes first. Mm-hmm. In the journal, that comes last. So mm -hmm. when he talks about transcribing Egyptian characters, that's one date, but that's after all the translation has been done. Huh. Um, now, maybe those, t those transcriptions of the characters are earlier, but if they're earlier, there's no journal entry to match it, and we're missing the ones that are described in the journal entry. So you have to pause it. We're missing some documents. Mm -hmm. If you want to put those early, or you can say, well, let's put them in the day where they said that they're transcribing. And maybe that's not entirely accurate, but you either have to hypothesize miss missing documents or hypothesize that there was no journal entry to correspond with that so uh, so based based on the journal entries that we have it comes after yeah based on the journal entries we have the only mention is after so mm -hmm. my inclination is to match the documents we have with that journal entry but that kind of plays havoc with some of the translation theories right uh, mm -hmm. again as a, a scholar you want to account for as much evidence as possible with your theory and you want to rely on hypothesized missing documents as the least that you can no theory that's out there all of the theories that are out there require missing documents hmm. It's just which ones are missing and where you place them and how much you say is missing. And so everybody has to, has to hypothesize that we're missing certain documents. It's the debate is then over which ones and how you match things up. It almost sounds like the Solomon Spalding manuscript lost things. It's like in some ways. Uh, well, well uh, yeah. so we know that Joseph Smith, for example, in his journal in 1842 says that he revised 
his translation to the book of Abraham. Mm -hmm. He translated and he revised. None of the documents that we have have the revision marks that would indicate, that would bring the documents in line to the printed manus, to the printed version. Mm. So, where are the revision marks? You have to say, well, we don't have, we don't have any of the revisions. Mm. We don't have most. Um, all the translation of the book of Abraham will take us from Abraham 1.1 to Abraham 2.18, which leaves you three and a half missing chapters. Hmm. And we get a couple of pages of that in Willard Richard's handwriting in 1842, but half of the book of Abraham we don't have a manuscript for. So... It's not that big of a book. <laughs> it's not that big of a book, but... Yeah. You have to suppose that there is a manuscript that's missing. Right. Uh, that he didn't do it directly to the typesetters. Right. Yeah, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there are missing manuscripts. There are, we know that there are missing papyri. We have a papyrus that goes with fac, matches with facsimile one. We don't have a papyrus that matches with facsimile two or three. Mm -hmm. Those are missing. We know they're missing because we have the copies. Mm -hmm. um, now, what's happened to the missing manuscript, and how much manuscript is how much ancient manuscript are missing? Well, there are people who dispute that there are missing manuscripts. I don't know how they account for the evidence. Mm -hmm. But so some of the manuscripts are missing. The question is then, how much? How do we know what it's like? Uh, and, and this is where. When you look at 18th century or 19th century eyewitnesses that describe scrolls, none of the manuscript fragments we currently have is a scroll, and all of them were mounted by 1837, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kerry Milstein and Alex Baugh have a nice article on that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the descriptions of these papyrus scroll come from after the fragments were mounted. So mm -hmm. there's still a scroll kicking around. We don't have that scroll. Mm -hmm. What's on that scroll, we don't know. Um, but you have to, you're, we have evidence of a missing scroll. Your theory has to account for it. Right. Um, people criticize me for saying that there's a missing scroll. Well, we have evidence for missing scrolls. Uh, now you can it's speculation what is actually on those missing scrolls mm -hmm. but we have eyewitness accounts that put the book of Abraham on those missing scrolls uh, actually mm -hmm. on a scroll um, these people saw it maybe they misunderstood what they were talking about uh, that's entirely possible mm -hmm. uh, we have records of um really interesting garblings. Charlotte mm -hmm. Hafen says that there's Hebrew and Sanskrit on the scrolls. Hebrew and Sanskrit, interesting. Yeah. Uh, how would she know? Oh, that's true, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, you know, that's what she says, and we can say, well, all right, she's, she's probably not in a position to recognize Hebrew or Sanskrit. Right. But we can, she at least testifies of, of these scrolls, mm -hmm. and I don't think she made up what she saw. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm willing to grant her what she does see. You know, when someone describes a vignette and says that there's a mm -hmm. snake walking on legs, and there is one of those in the papyri we have, mm -hmm. but they might be seeing another scene, that you have to give them the benefit of the doubt because they actually saw it, right. and we may not be seeing it. Uh, that they're accurate in the descriptions of what is in their competence to see. Mm -hmm. If they're describing it, I presume they know a difference between a scroll and a fragment. Mm -hmm. and A glass-mounted fragment, probably. A, yeah, a glass-mounted fragment. Well, that's what yeah. they say glazed slides. And one of them, one of the papyri, when it was fragments, when it was given to the church, still had the frame attached. Huh. 
So you have to account for the evidence, and that's so, the so we know based on the evidence there are there there is a missing scroll. At least at least we're, we're fairly confident there's a missing. There's scroll. at least one missing scroll. Yeah, there may be two because one of the things is there are two scrolls mm -hmm. and a bunch of fragments. Right. We have a bunch of fragments. So where are the scrolls? Where are the scrolls? What's on what's on them? Well, the only description of what's on them is Gustavo Seyfarth, and given what he says is on there and the way he translates other text, um, the best reconstruction we can make of it is something that says, beginning of the book of, and I wish I could finish the sentence. Hmm. Um, now, at Seyfarth, um, what do you do with that? Uh, hmm. because that would match his description based on something that he actually saw. Right. And which we know what the hieroglyphs were. Um, but he saw it and we don't, and we're trying to reconstruct what he saw from what he said, and you give it your best shot, and mm -hmm. you can quibble about how what's on there but he did see something mm -hmm. and he did describe what he saw to the best of his capability and what he saw was the beginning of the book of something or other yeah <laughs> so. fill in the blank um, yeah. we don't know and mm -hmm. the best that you can do is is work with the evidence you have and as I say the evidence is never as good as you'd like it. But what we do have is we do have what's, as you say, what's been translated, what is in the book of Abraham, and what is in the book of Abraham is actually fairly consistent with with things. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's what we have in the book of Abraham is consistent with, um, which we didn't really get into, but, right. uh, you know, we, one of the questions was saying something about human sacrifice being an anachronism in the book of Abraham. Yeah. I don't see why they're saying that because the time period when Abraham lived is the only time period where we have both archaeological, mm -hmm. historical, mm -hmm. and um, I guess we could call it uh, prescriptive or legal evidence for human sacrifice. So we have a text that tells when they would do human sacrifice, under what conditions they might do human sacrifice. We have the archaeological evidence of the Egyptians practicing human sacrifice, and we have historical accounts where the Egyptian kings say that they're doing it. So if Joseph Smith was guessing, he got the right time period. Well, we, <laughs> we have other time periods where we have uh, yeah. our either archaeological evidence, or we have textual evidence, mm -hmm. or iconographic evidence. But the time period when Abraham lives is when we've got all of it, hmm. um, except the the um, artistic depictions. Right. And so it's our best attested time period. Um, that you can't call that anachronism. That's a bullseye. Right. Uh, um, and so there are issues like that where he got it right. And you wouldn't expect him to get it right. Right. Um, there are other things in the book of Abraham. So it starts off, our only other preserved autobiography from Syria starts off with the same basic four phrases as the book of Abraham starts off with. Huh. Uh, and that wasn't discovered until the 1920s. Uh, if you're going to guess something that won't be demonstrated for 90 years in mm -hmm. advance, that's really good guessing. Joseph Smith, the extremely good guesser. Is the yeah, well, uh, yeah. Bill Hamlin used to talk about, uh, wonder why they didn't account for the things like the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon with time travel demons. Right, right. <laughs> that's great. Uh, you can come up with all kinds of explanations, but can you test the theories? Right. 
So our time's drawing to a close. Are there any final thoughts you want to give or anything that you think people should know about the Book of Abraham or Egyptology or anything like that? Uh, well, this is a sort of a bottomless pit of a subject. Um, yeah. For both the, the Book of Abraham, what we can say about the Book of Abraham is that um, in the last 30 years, uh, the the evidence has accumulated for uh, the Book of Abraham being historically authentic to the time of Abraham mm-hmm. uh, in ways that we would not have predicted um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when Hugh Nibley was ac- active in this. It's Some of the evidence has been um, some of it's been brought forth by Latter-day Saints and some of it's been brought forward by non-Latter-day Saints and some of the best uh, evidence for the Book of Abraham being historically authentic has been brought forth by people who are resolutely hostile to the church hmm. um, and so we're in a better position now to say that the Book of Abraham is authentic to Abraham's time and place uh, than we ever have been, and uh, and we're not done. And we're not done. <laughs> so, really, really appreciate your time here. I know you're probably still jet-lagged from your Egypt trip, and yet you came and spent time with us. I really appreciate it. I also yeah. want to give a shout-out to our technical crew here who who took time out of their family lot lives and 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 to help us put this all together. So thank you very much, guys. And with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. So thank you. <laughs>